Today, we return once again to a discussion of Itzal El, a very significant figure in the second part of Exodus, a figure from whom we have much to learn. Inevitably, a critically important message for us to always bear in mind as a foundation of our study is an idea that we have noted on many previous occasions, and that is, even when the Bible teaches us history, it's not coming to teach us history. The lessons are never lessons that only apply to the past. Most critically, they're lessons for us, for our present and our future. Bearing that in mind, we return once again to the story of the Tzavel and the lessons for us that emerge from them. In Exodus chapter 35, at the end of the chapter, we read factually a repetition of the charge of the Tzavel. Beginning in verse 30, and Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, God has called by name the Tzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Thor of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding the Hebrew. Tvuna is maybe better read as sagacity or insight and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise skillful works, to work in gold and silver and brass, and in cutting of stones for setting, and in carving of wood, to work in all manner of skillful workmanship. And he has put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiav, the son of Achishanak, of the tribe of Dan. Then has he filled with wisdom of heart, to work all manner of workmanship, of the craftsmen, of the skillful workmen, and so on. This is the end of Exodus chapter 35. And the very next verse, the first verse of chapter 36, emphasizes the roles of Bitzal El and Aholiav, his assistant, once again. And Bitzal El and Aholiav shall work and every wise-hearted man in whom God has put wisdom and understanding, sagacity, to know. Again, the same threesome. In the Hebrew, it is tzuna as what we're rendering as understanding or sagacity. The other attributes, wisdom, kochma, and ladat, that, knowledge, to know. To know how to do all the work to the service of the sanctuary, according to all that God commanded. And Moses called the Tzalel and Haulav and every wise hearted man in whom heart God has put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do. So here we have the charge of the Tzalel and Haulav and every wise hearted man. And indeed what follows is they get to work, as we'll see shortly. It is, I reiterate, important for us to note these attributes that are ascribed to every wise-hearted man at the beginning of Exodus chapter 36. The attributes that are specifically stressed with respect to Bitzel El back here in Chapter 35, verse 31, filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding or sagacity, and in knowledge. Again, in the Hebrew, the Chochmah, the Tvunah, or the Chapter 35 is not the first place where we encounter those terms with respect to Betzal El. Indeed, when Betzal El is first introduced in Exodus chapter 31, 
we encounter the self same description, the self same charge. At the beginning of chapter 31, when God says to Moses, beginning here in verse 2, See, I have called by name Bethel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him, again, same words, with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, and in understanding, sagacity, and in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship. Once again, in the Hebrew. Kochma, Tuna, and Da. To do all the things that need to be done. Continuing in verse 6. And I behold and appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Achisamach of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Now, besides that initial charge, what is of particular significance in chapter 31 is we get a list, a list of all the projects to which the Tzalel and the Holiav and their crew need to apply themselves. And here's the list. Beginning in verse 7, the tent of meeting, and the ark of testimony, and the ark cover that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tent. Verse 8, and the table and its vessels, and the pure candlestick, the menorah, with all its vessels, and the altar of incense. Verse 9, and the altar of burnt offering with all its vessels, and the laver and its base. Now, we should note that the order is by no means an incidental one here. And broadly speaking, we can't help but note that the order here makes a lot of sense. That is, the first item on the list is the tent of meeting. You need, after all, a structure. Some place where you're going to put all the furnishings. So that's the first thing here. Following that is the core vessel placed in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Testimony, and the Ark cover. Following that, the other vessels that go inside the tabernacle itself, the table and its vessels, the pure candlestick with all its vessels, and the altar of incense. Following them are the vessels that go not inside the tabernacle, but rather in front of the tabernacle, outside. The altar of burnt offering with all its vessels and the laver and its base. Well, the fact is that despite our not having seen that in the previous excerpt in chapter 35 and chapter 36, the list also appears in chapter 35, just not at the end of the chapter where we are reintroduced to the Talel. Rather, in chapter 35, at the beginning of the chapter, we encounter the self-same list with some additional details. In chapter 35, beginning with verse 11, the list of everything that needs to be done is the tabernacle, its tent and its coverings, its clasps, and its planks, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets. Again, this is the structure. The structure with, again, a lot more specificity and detail than in the relatively terse list in chapter 31. Then, in verse 12, the ark and the staves thereof, the ark cover, and the veil of the screen, that is, the partition, in front of the Holy of Holies, inside the tabernacle. Then, in the following three verses, with somewhat greater detail, the other three vessels that go inside the tabernacle, verse 13, the table and its staves, and all its vessels, and the choke red, verse 14, the candlestick, also for the light, and its vessels, and its lamps, and the oil for the light, verse 15, and the altar of incense and its staves. Now, verse 15 ends with mention of the screen that is at the entrance of the tabernacle, because, after all, it completes the description of everything that's on the inside. And then again, verse 
16, the altar of burnt offering with its grating of brass, its staves and old settles, the laver and its base, which completes the list of projects. Again, in somewhat greater detail, but of course, you'll note, in essentially the self-same order. Begin with the structure, then the ark and the ark cover, the core vessel in the Holy of Holies, then the other vessels that are inside the tabernacle, and then the vessels that are outside the tabernacle. The reason that we're stressing this order with such specificity is because, again, on the one hand, it does make quite a lot of sense to speak of the project in this sequence, but simultaneously, while this is a list of projects in chapter 31 and again in chapter 35, it is tantalizingly definitely not the order in which these projects are introduced. Back in Exodus chapter 25 and on, when God speaks to Moses and Moses conveys to us the list of projects, it doesn't start with what might seem to us the intuitively obvious beginning, which is having a tent, a building, a structure of some sort in which to put the furniture. How does it begin? It begins in Exodus chapter 25, verse 10, with the ark. Not the structure, but that most central of vessels. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. There's an emphasis, of course, that in the ark goes the testimony that I will give you, the testimony, of course, referring to the stone tablets upon which God inscribed the Ten Commandments. Then in verse 17, also pertaining to the assembly of the ark, you shall make an ark cover of pure gold. We then read its dimensions. And verse 18, you shall make two truvim of gold of beaten work on the ark cover. And then, of course, in verse 21, you put the ark cover upon the ark. Significantly, the Torah repeats here God's words, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. Again, the tablets inscribed by him with the Ten Commandments. So that's the first project on the list that is conveyed here through Moses in Exodus chapter 25. The second, you shall make a table of acacia wood, Again, the ancient two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And we read all the details that pertain to the table, culminating in the setting upon the table of the showbread before God always. Then, in verse 31, we encounter the next vessel that goes inside the sanctuary. And you shall make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work, shall the candlestick be made, even its base and its shaft, cups, knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece with it. The description then of the second of the three vessels that are outside of the Holy of Holies, but inside the tabernacle. You may, of course, have noticed that the third vessel that's inside the tabernacle and outside of the Holy of Holies, the incense altar, isn't on the list here. We'll get to it a little bit later in this version of the list. But it's specifically after chapter 25 describes these vessels. Recall, the ark and the ark cover, the table 
and the candlestick, the menorah. After those are already described, we get to chapter 26. Chapter 26 tells us about the structure. At the beginning of the chapter, with verse 1, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains. The lower layer of curtains are made of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet. Then, after describing these curtains in the first six verses of the chapter, with verse 7 we read, And you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. That is, the tabernacle is the lower curtains. Then over them, the curtains of goat's hair. They are described in the succeeding verses through verse 13. And with verse 14, the final cover or covers, and you shall make a covering for the tent of ram's skins dyed red and a covering of seal skins above. Whether these were two separate additional coverings or one composite covering is a question that we'll leave unsettled here. But in any case, these are the various layers that cover the physical wooden structure of the tabernacle. And then we get to the structure itself. In verse 15, and you shall make the planks for the tabernacle of acacia wood standing up. And there is a very detailed description of how these planks are to be made, culminating in verse 29, which completes the description of the planks. You shall overlay the planks with gold and make the rings of gold for holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. And verse 30, and you shall rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which has been shown you in the mountain. That completes the physical structure. There are two additional aspects that I suppose could be described as part of the physical structure, and they then are introduced in the final verses of chapter 26. In verse 31, and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. This is the veil that is placed upon four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold in verse 32 and situated between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the sanctuary. That is, with the ark and the ark cover upon it in the Holy of Holies on the inside and the other vessels that go inside the tabernacle on the outside. And then in verses 36 and 37, we read of the final component of the structure, and that is, you shall make a screen for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine blind linen, the work of weavers in colors, and you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold, their hooks shall be of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of brass for them. This is the entrance of the tabernacle. We're still not finished because so far we've only been speaking of what goes inside the tabernacle, or what is the tabernacle itself. In chapter 27, we read of the altar that goes outside of the tabernacle. You shall make the altar of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And what indeed follows in the ensuing verses through verse 8 is a description of the altar, culminating in hollow with boards. You shall make it as it has been shown you in the mount, so shall they make it. Description of the altar. Of course, inevitably, we can't help but note that there are two components that are not presented at all in Exodus chapters 25, 26, and 27. And they both appear in Exodus chapter 30, at the beginning of the chapter, and you shall make an altar to burn incense upon, acacia wood, 
shall you make it. And in verse 18, unrelated in context to any of the other vessels, you shall also make a labor of brass and the base thereof of brass where at to wash. And shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water therein. In the interest of full disclosure, I must concede that the anomalous placement of the commandment concerning the altar of incense and the commandment concerning the labor in chapter 30 really warrant a separate and distinct discussion, and we're not going to be discussing that today. But what we do need to consider is the glaring difference in order between what we saw in the lists in Exodus chapter 31 and chapter 35 on the one hand, and what we see in the initial command concerning the tabernacle and its vessels in chapters 25, 26, and 27. Now, of course, you will undoubtedly note that I could have presented chapters 25, 26, and 27 first, and then I would be telling you that chapters 31 and 35 are anomalous with respect to the original command. Instead of presenting it this way, that we have lists in chapter 31 and 35, and the original command is anomalous with respect to the list. But besides chapters 31 and 35 presenting us twice with the same order of the list as distinct from the original command, we also, of course, will need to consider what happens in the actual execution. Now, I'm going to reiterate there was a kind of intuitive logic to the order that we saw in chapters 31 and 35. And that was a logic based upon, if you will, practicality. How can you talk about making vessels if you don't have any place to put the vessels? You only have a place to put the vessels if the first project is making the tabernacle, the structure. That was what informed those lists. That's something, again, that we first encounter in chapter 31, where we list the projects that need to be executed. And maybe not at all irrelevant to this observation is how chapter 31 began. We noted these verses already earlier, but it's important for us to consider their strategic placement now because these verses are situated after the initial command and before the lists of what needs to be done and the actual execution of what needs to be done referring to, at the beginning of Exodus chapter 31, the introduction of Bitzal El. First place where Bitzal El appears in the Bible. Again, verse 2, see, I have called by name Bitzal El, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding, sagacity, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Then came the list. Then comes the execution. In the continuation of Exodus chapter 36, beginning with verse 8, and every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains. Remember the curtains? of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet. The lowest layer 
of draperies that cover the tabernacle. And then beginning in verse 14, he made curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Of course, inevitably, when you encounter he made in the singular, you realize the antecedent of he is first and foremost. L. And in verse 19, and he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of seal skins above. After the description of the draperies that serve as the roof and sides covering the tabernacle, beginning in verse 20, the wooden structure underneath them. And he made the planks for the tabernacle of the Tisha wood standing up. And then, once again, a description of how these planks are to be constructed, culminating with, and he overlaid the planks with gold and made the wings of gold for holders for bars and overlaid the bars with gold. And inevitably, this progression is one of the structure. It concludes with the final aspect of the structure. And he made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen. This is the veil that separates between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the tabernacle that is hung from four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold. And then, verse 37, he made a screen for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. This is the entrance in the front of the tabernacle, hung from five pillars that are overlaid, they with their capitals and fillets with gold. So this completes the description of the structure. I have to admit, this is something that is practically relentlessly driven home to us in the whole description in Exodus chapters 36, 37, and 38, the description of the vessels, the description of the construction projects. The very words themselves are practically verbatim reiterations of everything that we saw back in Exodus chapters 25, 26, and 27. The initial commands. There it was, they shall make, here it is, and they, or he, made. But the exact same description of what is in fact made. The only difference is, and this is a glaring difference, the order. Because here, as we saw it in the lists of the project after the Tel El was introduced, that's critical. In chapter 31 and 35, the order beginning with the physical structure, the order being practical. You need a place to put the furnishings. That's how everything starts out. That is Exodus chapter 36. It is specifically in chapter 37 that we get to the vessels. And the order of the vessels in chapter 37 is, one can't help but note, exactly the same order as we encountered in chapter 31 and chapter 35. And the fellow made the Ark of Acacia wood in Verse 6, and he made an ark cover of pure gold. Verse 7, and he made two cherubim of gold. This then describes the construction of the ark and the ark cover. Beginning in verse 10, and he made the table of acacia wood, with its dimensions and all various details that pertain to the table. In verse 17, and he made the candlestick, the menorah of pure gold, with everything that pertains to that. In verse 25, 
and he made the altar of incense of acacia wood, giving its dimensions and the details that pertain to it. Note, the same order of vessels that we encountered in the list in Exodus chapter 31 and chapter 35, indeed, it's actually the same order that we saw in the original command, except for the obvious differences that the ark in Exodus chapter 25 was the very first thing that was mentioned before there was a structure at all. And, of course, while the order of the other vessels that go inside the tabernacle was also the same there, that is, table, candlestick, incense altar. Incense altar, as we noted, was relegated to chapter 30, for reasons that we're not going to discuss right now. Beyond the perfectly sensible order of the vessels that go inside the tabernacle, Exodus chapter 38 gives us the vessels that go outside the tabernacle. Again, perfectly sensible order. And he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. And then we read the description of the altar through verse 7. And in verse 8, and he made the labor of brass and the base thereof of brass. Describing the other vessel that goes outside of the tabernacle itself. So again, I'm going to repeat the warning that I stated at the outset. Sometimes people have a feeling that we're being excessively picky in harping on details. But of course, when you believe the Torah is God's word revealed, Perhaps I should better describe that as God's will revealed through his word. And of course you take the words seriously. They're there for a reason. They're not there to teach us history. They're not there to tell us what was again. They're there to tell us what is or what should be. They give us messages for our lives. Messages that of course we only glean. Are reading carefully. And so, then, this completes the array of the various vessels that are put both inside and outside the tabernacle and the building of the tabernacle itself. And finally, we get to the summation in chapter 38. We should note that in these verses, in chapter 38, we encounter the last reference to Bitzal El in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. That is, in the summation at the end of the chapter, these are the accounts of the tabernacle, even the tabernacle of the testimony, as they were rendered according to the commandment of Moses, through the service of the Levites by the hand of Tamar, the son of Aaron the priest, and, verse 22, Bitzal El, the son of Uri, the son of Pur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that God commanded Moses. Of course, the following verse, we also read of the attribution to Ahoyav and the others who were involved in the project. But I feel compelled to harp on a nuance in verse 22, one that in our tradition is highlighted, and that is, Bitzalel made all that God commanded Moses doesn't say that he made all that Moses had commanded him. But on some plane, in some sense, Bittal El's projects resonated with what God commanded Moses. Maybe in a different vein, different perspective, from the manner in which Moses 
resonated with those commands that he received himself. I realize I'm being a bit obscure here. Let's get far more practical. On the one hand, we've been very practical. Practical in noting the order of the project as presented, at this point we can say, three times in the list in chapter 31, and again in the list in chapter 35, with greater detail, and with greatest detail of all, the actual execution. The projects themselves in chapters 36, 37, and 38. Everything was very clear. First, you make the structure. You make the building. You address the practical need to have some place to put the furnishings. And then, take care of the furnishings. The ark and the ark cover, and then the table, the candlestick, the menorah, and the incense altar. And then, of course, the vessels that go outside of the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 25, it didn't happen that way. The original command seemed to be so anomalous, so impractical, so elusive, it seemed to us that it really didn't make sense. Did it? Of course, inevitably, what we need to consider in Exodus chapter 25 is what the underlying principle is that indeed informs listing the art specifically first. No, it of course is not an order that is motivated by considerations of practicality. The original order. At the beginning of Exodus chapter 25, when we read of the initial command concerning the tabernacle, starting at the beginning of the chapter with verse 1, God spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they take for me an offering of every man whose heart makes him willing or whose heart impels him to generosity. You shall take my offering, the offering going to the construction of this tabernacle. And with respect to the tabernacle, there's a goal, a purpose. So succinctly articulated in verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Among them. Note this well. Not merely make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in it. Because the goal, after all, is not to construct a sanctuary so that God will dwell in the sanctuary. God doesn't dwell in the sanctuary. The heavens and heaven's heavens cannot contain you, all the more so this house that I have built. No, the purpose of the sanctuary is not to provide God with a house. Rather, but to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's the goal. Well, if we ask ourselves, how is this goal to be achieved? Is the goal achieved by simply the physical structure of the tabernacle? Again, God doesn't need a house. The physical structure is not what epitomizes the advancement of this goal. The purpose is much more aptly described first by in verse 10, and they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Why is that ark so important? We reiterate what these verses here explicitly reiterate. In verse 16, 
and you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. And after the description of the ark cover in verses 17 and on, in verse 21, and you shall put the ark cover upon the ark, and in the ark, and you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. Testimony. The stone tablets upon which God inscribed the Ten Commandments. God's word, God's teaching. What basis is there for the fulfillment of that charge to make a sanctuary for God so that God dwells among us? Any more aptly than God's word revealed, God's will revealed through his word, his teachings, the Torah. So that, of course, is one critical aspect for us, inevitably, to bear in mind. As we discussed some time ago, when we spoke of the whole purpose of the physical temple as a kind of perpetuation in miniature of Mount Sinai and God's revelation upon it, critical aspect of God continuing well among us is the perpetuation of that legacy of Sinai. Epitomized by the tablets of stone with the divine script Ten Commandments. No, we don't have that today. Tragically. But it's important for us to appreciate that to whatever extent we legitimately strive to have God's presence abide among us, it is necessarily a reflection of our ongoing commitment to those words. His will, the perpetuation of God's revelation at Sinai in our midst. And there's an additional dimension. And that additional dimension perhaps is even more striking and more directly relevant to the mission of Moses in the world. Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. After the description of the ark cover being placed upon the ark. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the ark cover. From between the two keruvim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. Of all things that I give you in commandment unto the people of Israel. Well, this is also... Inevitably, a critical part of the perpetuation of Mount Sinai, the Ark and the Ark of it, aren't merely two vessels, one composite vessel, depending upon how you view it, in the Holy of Holies. This is the focal point of God's ongoing revelation to Moses in the midst of the nation in conveying through Moses God's commandments unto the people of Israel. And indeed, so it was. As we read at the end of Numbers chapter 7, verse 89, and when Moses went into the tent of meeting that he, God, might speak with him, then he heard the voice speaking unto him from above the ark cover that was upon the ark of the testimony, from between the two Kiruvim, and he, God spoke unto him. Is there any wonder then that the ark and the ark cover are listed first? Not as a statement of practicality, as a statement, if you will, of teleology, the ultimate end, the purpose, the final goal. This, after all, is the basis of, again, Number one, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The ark signifying 
God's will and his word revealed in the nation, in the world. And, number two, I will speak with you there. From above the ark cover, from between the two proving which are upon the ark of testimony. Ongoing divine revelation in the midst of the nation. This obviously isn't something that applies only for the sake of Moses. It is, after all, for the benefit of the world. God's will revealed continuously through Moses, but specifically there. Beginning the commands that pertain to the construction of the tabernacle with the ark doesn't do much for practicality, does it? And practically speaking, that isn't the way things were done. But if we're talking about actualizing the goal of God's indwelling in our midst, could anything possibly come first before the Holy Ark? This inevitably, in particular, speaking of the extraordinary level of divine revelation that came to Moses from above the Ark cover that was upon the Ark of his testimony from between the two provisions necessarily pertains also to the unique prophetic level of Moses. Now, the uniqueness of Moses' prophecy is something that we've addressed on other occasions. It is something that is affirmed and reaffirmed in the Torah. Just to review briefly, in Exodus chapter 6, we read of the comparison between God's revelation to Moses and his revelation to the greatest prophet who preceded Moses, patriarchs. In chapter 6, verse 2, And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am God. I am God, referring to the Tetragrammaton, God's holy name. And in verse 3, known to them, not to them, but to you, yes. Again, the level of prophecy of Moses transcending the greatest prophets who preceded him. And with respect to prophets who were contemporaneous with Moses, in Numbers chapter 12, God says, by way of rebuking Aaron and Miriam. My servant Moses is not so. He is trusted in all my house. With him do I speak mouth to mouth, even manifestly. And with sight that is not by allegories, and the similitude of God he beholds. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant against Moses? And with respect to all prophets, Ever after Moses, in the third from last verse of Deuteronomy, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom God knew face to face. Moses signifies then a parallel level of prophecy, and it is, obviously, a reflection of that unparalleled level of prophecy that is expressed in that unique role that is designated for the ark and the ark cover. There I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the ark cover, from between the two kruvim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things that I will give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. So it is specifically a reflection of Moses's, if you will, ontological uniqueness as a prophet at his level that renders the ark and the ark cover of such critical importance. It is an additional nuance that I feel compelled to stress. And this is, I suppose we could say, the most visible expression of 
the uniqueness of Moses and his unparalleled level of prophecy. And that's what we read in Exodus chapter 34. In verse 28, and he, Moses, was there with God 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he, God, wrote upon the tablets the words of the covenant, the ten words. Verse 29. And it came to pass, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses knew not that the skin of his face sent forth beams, became radiant, while God had spoken with him. And so we read in the following verse, when Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face sent forth beams, or had become radiant. The physical skin became white. In Hebrew, skin is or. Light is or. Sounds similar, different letters. The physical all becomes all luminous, radiant. Moses transcends the very bounds of physicality itself. He is, in a literal sense, beyond. Verse 35, and the children of Israel saw the face of Moses. So the skin of Moses' face, again, sent forth beams, had become radiant. Moses is the whole life. And it's at this moment that we need to bear in mind a short but critically important Hebrew lesson. And that refers to the name of Bitzalel in Hebrew. Bitzalel is really Hebrew for in the shadow, God. Bitzel, El. What a poignant and instructive comparison between the two people who played the most critical roles in being able to have a tabernacle in Israel. Moses and Bethel. Moses, who doesn't even cast a shadow. On the contrary, Moses is all light. He's a source of divine illumination in the world. Once God spoke with him at Sinai. And Bethel El. Bethel El, ironically, described as the one who is standing in the shadow of God. What does that mean? In the shadow of God here. I think that this one, we can glean a sense of what that tells us of Bitzel El's unique role and unique mission in taking an idealized temple as conveyed to him by Moses and translating it into a real one. Moses, at his level, all light, doesn't relate to questions of practicality. For him, practicality is peripheral or even insignificant. For Moses, practical issues like where do you put the furniture are not of paramount importance. What is of paramount importance is, of course, the ark. The ark and the ark cover. They are preeminent. They are the basis of the cohesion with God that the tabernacle is intended to establish, that I shall dwell among them. So for Moses, it would be inconceivable, really, to present anything at all in the whole construction project before presenting core, core, the holy art. That must be first. But the Talel doesn't see things that way. Bitzalel sees things from the shadows. 
the physical world, of course, has to be real in order to cast the shadow. It's not simply tracks out. It has substance. And that substance needs to be addressed. Well, the truth is, that substance really does need to be addressed. When you live in a physical world, if you don't translate the sublime abstractions of spirituality into something tangible, the physical means of expressing the ideals, you fail. Truth be told, Moses, by himself, could not have produced a physical section. A sublime, ethereal one? Certainly. You need a Bitsalo to make a physical sanctuary. Someone who is in the shadow and sees things from the perspective of the shadows. And we can't help but emphasize here those attributes that we noted at the outset. And with this, we conclude. Chokhmah, Tuna, Da. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in his understanding, sagacity, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Significant to note that these attributes, wisdom, understanding, sagacity, knowledge, chokhmah, tuna, and da'at, are implicated in the description of creation itself. In Psalm 104, verse 24, how manifold are your works, O Lord, in wisdom, with chokhmah. You made them all. And in Psalm 136, verse 5, to him that by understanding, sagacity, tibuna, made the heavens. Well, wisdom and understanding, sagacity, chokhmah, and tuna. In Jeremiah, twice, we find both of them implicated in the same verse. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12, and identically, in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 15, he who made the earth by his power and has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his understanding or sagacity, I can't help but note here that the differences in the translation in English have no basis in the Hebrew. The Hebrew verses are different. Both wisdom and the understanding, sagacity, the chokhmah and the tzunah, and then, of course, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, we find all three, the Chokhmah, the Tzvuna, and the Da. God, by wisdom, founded the earth, by understanding, sagacity, he established the heavens, by his knowledge, the depths were cleaved and the skies dropped down their dew. Why am I emphasizing this? This is what God does. Yes, this is what God does. And we, of course, are obviously not God. And yet, on some plane, we are summoned to emulate God, to go in His footsteps. Because what, after all, is the essence of the creation of the physical world? Isn't it taking ethereal abstractions and concretizing them as something physical, actual, the world? Well, that's what God does. He summons us to be his junior partners in doing that as well on our level. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, God gives wisdom, out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding, sagacity in the Hebrew. The same list. Chochmah. Da'at and Tzunat. And likewise, in verses 10 and 11 of the same chapter, or chapter 2, for wisdom shall enter into your heart and knowledge shall be pleasant unto your soul. Discretion, thought, purpose shall watch over you. Understanding, sagacity, will guard you. Once again, in the Hebrew, Kochma, Da'at, Tzunat. It's not enough for them to exist in the realm of the divine. They need to exist in your realm as well. 
it should come as no surprise to us that just as these were the attributes bestowed upon Bitzalel, who really is charged to serve as God's junior partner in actualizing the ethereal abstractions in a real physical sanctuary, so too will the self-same words, Shuram of Tyre, is granted the same gifts in building the holy temple of King Solomon. In the first book of Kings, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre, and he was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, and he was filled with stainless wisdom and understanding, sagacity and skill, knowledge, once again, the Chochmah, the Tuna, and the Da'at, through which to discharge the mission. And it is specifically thus that all the work that King Solomon wrought in the house of God was completed, taking the abstractions and making them real. It's true for making a temple. It's true for everything. It summons to all of us. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3, 4, and 5, through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding, sagacity, it is established. By knowledge are the chambers filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of knowledge and peace of strength. Chochmah, Zuna, and Da'at, once again. The means through which we take the loftiest of ideals and actualize them as something The end of this story is found in Exodus chapter 31. That is, returning to the tabernacle, in verse 32 we read, Thus was finished all the work of the tabernacle of the tabernacle of meeting, and the children of Israel did according to all that God commanded Moses, so did they. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses. And one more time, we read in order all the projects that were involved in producing the tabernacle. And it's important for us to stress specifically, especially here. It's not the order of Exodus chapter 25. That was an order of abstractions. That was an order of lofty ideals. That was an order of purpose. And of course, you need to know your purpose before you get to work. Because otherwise, you don't know what you're doing. But once you know your purpose, you also need to get practical. To actualize the loftiest ideals, the most ethereal goals in the real world. Because in this world, spirituality that is too abstract is liable to be counterfeit. In this world, they bring to Moses, first, the tent and all its furniture, its clasps, its planks, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the physical structure. And the covering of ram's skins dyed red, and the covering of seal skins, and the veil of the screen, everything that pertains to the structure, only after the Ark of the Testimony in the stage, the Ark cover, and then the table, and the candlestick, the menorah, and then the golden altar of incense. Then the vessels that go outside of the tabernacle, the brazen altar, and the laver and its face. According to testifies in verse 42, according to all that God commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. This was really, truly, what God had commanded Moses. Moses resonated with it in one way, at his level. This was truly in resonance with what God had commanded. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as God had commanded 
even so had they done it. And Moses left them. Moses realized this is the way it needs to be done. The greatest blessing is to take the loftiest ideals and harness them in making this world a more godly, more blessed place. May we too learn the lesson of the Talel in taking our idealized temples and making them real and bringing God's blessings into this real world. It's the greatest blessing of all. God bless you.